all the way from Bokota village in Limpopo, South Africa, we bring you Missionary Minds, where you can learn about family, church history, biblical worldview issues, and of course, missions, all from the mind of a real world missionary of almost 20 years. And Buripol, in the past, we've spoken about different missionaries who were great men of God, who are pioneers, but it seemed that there was something lacking in the home life, or at least how they treated their family. And we want to discuss a bit more about that today. So the question we're addressing is, how does one keep a balance between ministry and family? Over to you, Mfundisi. First, the story. The year is 1829, and Anthony Norris Groves attempts to do something that no one had ever attempted to do. This is coming off the heels of the work of William Carey, who is the father of modern missions. And the missionary movement is just picking up speed in the 1800s, the following of the Great Commission commandment. And Anthony Norris Groves is not just any man who's thinking about going into missions. This is someone who is a trained dentist. He has a wonderful salary. He has a beautiful wife. He has three children. And now he feels called not just to give to missions financially, but to go himself. And he tells his wife. And his wife is moved to tears. And he says the time is not ready yet. And eventually, he ends up taking his family, going to Persia, which generally would be Iraq today. He goes to Baghdad. He doesn't choose choose any field. He essentially chooses the most difficult field in the world. He goes to the place of 100 mosques. He, He goes to a place where it might be the hottest location top 10 in the world. Uh, He goes to a place where it takes 5,000 miles to travel there in a a covered wagon, essentially. Uh, He goes to a place where he's not promised to have a salary. He's going to a place where there is plague and cholera and disease and war and flooding. He's going to a place where people would say it was irresponsible to take a family. And so he tells his wife, and his wife is not just anyone. His wife came from a very prominent home, a wealthy home. She comes to Christ, and her parents could kind of read the writing on the wall, and they said, if you go into missions, you will forfeit the 10,000, 12,000 pounds of inheritance, which today would be about a million and a half dollars. You're going to forfeit this. And these are all kinds of the the ideas that are going on behind this question of, should I go to the mission field? And when his wife pushes back, I love what Anthony Norris Groves does. He doesn't force her. He, He writes in his journal, this is not the time. And so he continues on serving the Lord, praying for his wife. Actually, they were married. Um, and loved the Lord, but actually his wife wasn't even truly converted. She's converted, and now she starts thinking more about, okay, uh, baby steps, we'll tithe next. That'll be our, our step towards missions, okay? We'll tithe. Then they go towards tithing. Then he brings it up to her again. He, she says, what about the children? No. He says, okay, the times. And then she says, okay, let's go to Ohio. Well, that's in the U.S., but back in the 1800s, Ohio is kind of like a middle ground between Europe England and Baghdad. Um, at least they had English, and it would still be traveling to the other side of the world. It would still be poverty, but not the same extent. Let's go to Ohio. That falls through. Eventually, his wife says, I don't, I'm not just willing to go. I want to go to the mission field. She knew what she was doing. She knew the dangers. She knew that death awaited her, and she was right. Death did await her. And she died within probably a year or so of arriving in Baghdad, including their infant daughter. So now he, there he is with his two sons. And that's kind of the way the, the, the missionary story begins with Anthony Norris Groves, which makes us think, how does this relate to family? How should we 
where should we put family in the tier of things? Should it be above ministry, below ministry? Was Anthony Norris Groves wrong in the way he handled this situation? And not just Groves, this is just one example. You could talk about John Payton. You could talk about Adoniram Judson. And essentially, all of the great missionaries of the past, they were faced with these kinds of decisions. I thought this was a good kind of launching off point, the life of Anthony Norris Groves and, and how he addressed these issues with family as we seek to, to think through how family coincides with our ministry endeavors. Thank you, brother. And as I'm listening to you here, I'm thinking of the many wives that may be listening to this with husbands in ministry or the husbands themselves who are in ministry. and we're speaking about Anthony Norris Groves because of how the Lord used him and how much he sacrificed. So isn't ministry this glorious endeavor which we should be willing to sacrifice all for and give all for? And shouldn't wives and children just get with the program when it comes to ministry? I wouldn't put it that way, just get with the program, because if you lose your family, you have no ministry. So family must be above ministry. And that's why the qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy 3 talks about the family. If, you're, if your family is not in order, then your ministry cannot be in order. It's from um, least to greatest. If you cannot keep your congregation of five people, if I could put it that way, if you can't keep them happy and in order, then the argument is, how are you going to keep your congregation of 50 or 500 happy and in order? And the answer is you can't. So start small. Um, if you can prove you can do arithmetic, then maybe we'll have you do uh, trigonometry. And if you can prove that you can keep your little congregation in order, then that might be indicative that you can keep the larger family in order. So one of the great responsibilities that we have in ministry is making sure that our wives are are happy and that our children are happy. Uh, isn't that what Romans 15 says, um, to, to have joy in believing? That's one of the great prayers that I pray for my wife, Melinda, that she would have joy in believing. Now, keeping her happy and content doesn't mean keeping her from all danger. Uh, it doesn't mean giving the family everything they want. It doesn't mean living a life of opulence or affluence. But it does mean that they are, have the joy of the Lord within them. And that should be the primary goal ahead of ministry. So let's go back to Groves. He could see that this was the wrong time to force his wife. And pastors should be thinking about this right now, or missionaries should be thinking about this. I had a man in the United States who said, what should I do? I want to go to the mission field and my wife doesn't. And I would say, don't go. Uh, I, I, not don't go full stop, but don't go yet. Um, there, this, needs to be, this needs to be a joint decision. Now, this doesn't mean <clears throat> uh, she might go with <clears throat> trepidation and fear and all that. Okay, that's natural. She's a weaker vessel. Uh, but you need to be on the same page on this because... <clears throat> Uh, the Christian life is hard enough as it is. Going to the mission field with a wife who doesn't want to be there is going to cause lots of problems. So make sure that your wife's heart is in the right place. That's what Groves did. When he saw that his wife was in tears, I cannot possibly leave my parents. He said, okay, this is not the time. Let's pray about it. He went on for another six months. He went back to her. Hey, oh, I'm still, I'm still dying to go to the mission field. Now he's in his early 30s. I'm so dying to go to the mission field. But what about, but slowly she was thawing. I think Groves gives the right example, uh, the right balance of ministry and family in that particular situation. Hmm. Thank you, brother. And uh, as you're saying that, I'm thinking of the many people who are thinking of decisions of whether to go into ministry, whether it's missions or pastoral ministry or whatever it may be, and wrestling back and forth with how much the family is ready for it. 
So if we go back to Anthony Norris Groves, what did it then turn out like in the field? He had children, right? And uh, how did that turn out? Was it all smooth sailing from then on or were there some challenges as well with the children? Yes, definite challenges. And that's one of the great benefits of missionary biography, if it's a good biography, in that it doesn't cover the warts of our heroes. And isn't that what the Bible does too? Mm. The Bible must be a spiritual, uh, supernatural book because it shows us all the warts of our, of our heroes. Not, not all the time. Hebrews 11 doesn't point out the warts of the heroes of the faith, at least in that chapter. But if you go back and read their stories, it does. It's the same thing with great missionary biographies. Although sometimes I do think they maybe gloss over some of their weaknesses more than they should. I think of a professor I had who hated biographies because he said it just depressed him. It's like, I can't possibly, and this is an older man. I mean, he was a mentor of mine. He said it depresses me because I can't attain to that kind of thing. I can understand that a little bit. Uh, the two volume of Hudson Taylor should probably be read with the little volume next to it, which is, I think it's called uh, Hudson and Maria or something like that. It's about their marriage. And in that book, Pollock specifically brings out some of the things they did that maybe wasn't appropriate for the Victorian era that they kind of left out. But then you see the passion that they had to get married and, and all the kind of things they did in preparation for marriage that they kind of left out uh, that maybe wouldn't have uh, take, taken a little shine off of Hudson Taylor. So I think there's value to that, give, giving both sides and giving the, the strengths and the weaknesses. And I see that in Groves. In one sense, Groves did an excellent job with his boys. It was Frank and Henry they were, what, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old when they go off to Baghdad, and they turned out great. They were very loyal to their father. They went through horrible trials. They lost their mother. They lost their sister. They dealt with rheumatic fever and typhoid and all of these difficulties, and yet in the end, they loved the Lord. They loved their father. They were not bitter towards Christianity. So in that sense, really good. Thumbs up. But then you look at Edward. Edward was their youngest, and Edward had a lot of problems, so many problems that he was actually placed in an asylum, an insane asylum for some time of his life. I think he went through uh, a terrible divorce. He was in and out of churches, and a, really a sad story with Edward. But even there, you can learn from it, because if you look at Edward's life, he always felt neglected. Now, this was the child of Anthony Norris Groves and his second wife, Harriet. And Harriet was an excellent Bible teacher, so he gave her a lot of room to teach. But she didn't really like home life that much, and she didn't organize her home very well. So they had a lifelong nanny, basically, who took care of the kids. And in some ways it helped, but I think it gave bad fruit in the future. Edward felt neglected by his parents. And he even said there was one point where he hadn't seen his mother for something like 12 years. And you look at this story of how did it turn out that way? Why was Edward such a mess? And why were the older two boys such great successes? In fact, if you look at Henry and Frank, you would think that perhaps they would have been the mess because they were the ones who lost their mother. They went through all the fevers and typhoid and flooding and cholera and wars. They were the ones who were traveling all over the world. They were the ones who were sent off to school. They were the ones who really faced the majority of the difficulties where Edwards had, a, he had a little bit more of a, an easier life. And this is, this is just so important. This point is so important. And that is, it was because the time that Edward failed to have with his parents, as opposed to Frank and Henry, who spent all of their time with their father. It is so important to be with your parents. And there's even a later story uh, about the, uh, it's about the Bowdens and the Beers. I can't remember which one it was, but one of those families, the man, he dies at 
41 years of age from heat stroke. He was an amazing missionary. No one's ever heard of him. He went through very difficult times getting people to follow Christ. Then he dies. And what do his children do? They take up the mantle and now they're leading people to Christ. And it really was success through his children. I love reading about things like that. One of the best quotes in the book by Robert Dan, I want to read to you because he helps us think carefully about the importance of spending time with our children. Do not, do not forsake your children on the altar of ministry. And Edward often would look at it and say, he'd say, I wish I was one of the mission kids. Like I'd get more attention. And I have to be careful about that too, because we all want to see people that come to Christ. We don't want to favor our children unnecessarily. We, we, we know that our children have some advantages that the other children don't. And so we kind of lean towards the other side. And in doing that, we can sometimes neglect them. Listen to this outstanding quote, which really is advice that Dan gives to parents. He says this, quote, As we look back on the lives of the brothers, We might wonder how it was that Henry and Frank, who suffered all the physical horrors of Baghdad, grew up so sane, balanced, and we might also say conventional, while Edward, who had a commonplace private school upbringing like any other Victorian boy with parents overseas, should turn out strangely. Now, pause there for a moment. He's setting up. He's saying, why did Henry and Frank, who had all the difficulties, turn out so wonderfully, and Edward, who had all the blessings, turned out so poorly? Back to the quote, the reason may lie in the fact that Henry and Frank faced the horrors of Baghdad, here it is, with their father and mother, secure in their parents' love and affection, while Edward, feeling uncared for and abandoned, suffered the horrors of Tusculum on his own. Experience shows that a child needs the love of his parents or substitute parents More than anything else, assured of it, he can face almost any adversity. Deprived of it, he may be left with scars that never heal. That's sound advice to parents. And he basically says, they turned out so well because they spent so much time with their parents. And Edward struggled so much. Not because of the easy life, but he struggled because he wasn't with his parents. Let that be a warning to us, mother and father. Mm. Thank you, brother. And I'm thinking of a conversation my wife and I were having just yesterday or the night before. My father wasn't a perfect man, and I love him and I want to honor his memory, but he wasn't perfect. And even despite that, I still love him and I miss him. He's passed on now. And my wife was just saying the other night, uh, the other day that, hey, I wish I could have met your father. I can imagine what he's like because of how you speak about him, how you imitate him. And I I think I would have had so much fun uh, just meeting him and interacting with him. So that's helpful there. And uh, just as we get back to the conversation here, you spoke about getting the smaller congregation right before you get the big congregation right. And in one sense, your small congregation is quite big. You have eight children and with your wife, so you have nine people you have to spiritually take care for and uh, make sure that they're happy and content and have joy in the Lord. What are some challenges that arise either from uh, your personal experience or from other people you know of in ministry of balancing out these tensions between uh, giving yourself to the ministry, but not uh, uh, taking away from what your family needs? Well, I would say one of the most important things for both sides, your small congregation and big congregation, is in, in some ways similar, and that is make sure both of them are in, in their corresponding churches. So for the big congregation, now would be be with God's people in what we would consider church today, especially on Sunday morning and throughout the week. So one of the best ways that you can minister to them is in a formal setting where you stand behind the pulpit and you preach to them. You can do it in informal settings too, meeting them at their home, having a cup of coffee with them, but make sure they're in that formal setting. That's a very important time 
where you feed them spiritually from the pulpit. If you miss that time, that formal time, you're just going to really struggle as a Christian, which is why Martin Lloyd-Jones, when people would want to take up his time for counseling, and he'd say, why are you coming consistently to church? He'd say something like, if you come to church consistently 12 Sundays in a row or something, then maybe I'll sit down and counsel you. But you can't, you can't miss the main meal and then ask for you know, a snack later on. And I would say it's the same way with the family. There needs to be a formal time that the father comes together. We can call it his church service. And you know what I'm going to say because I talk about it all the time, but that, that'd be family worship. Now, that's not the only time. There's informal times with your children, just like there's informal times with your church people. In fact, there's more informal times. There's the dinner table and, and there's uh, baseball practice and uh, playing games with them with cards and driving in the car and all of those things, those are informal. But I just think it's so important to have a formal, consistent church time with your family in your home. And I would like to call it historically what it has been called, and that is family worship. There ought to be a consistent time where you're sitting down, opening the Bible, reading to them, singing with them, praying with them, confessing your sin with them, on your knees with them. This needs to be a part of uh, the daily practice of a father. And when he does that, he'll start to see cracks in the wall. He'll start to see cracks in the foundation. He'll start to see so-and-so is not reading carefully because his mind is on something else, or it's because he's got sin in his heart, or because there's tension in the home. That's a really important uh, barometer, thermometer, thermostat uh, of getting together with your family and determining where they are spiritually, sitting down and saying, mama, how are, how are the kids? How are the kids doing? And then uh, so-and-so is struggling. So-and-so is struggling. All right, so I'm going to take a walk with so-and-so in the morning. Just one-on-one time. Yes, I have eight children. So there's a lot of us-ness. There's a lot of together time. It's, and, in fact, it's really hard to get one-on-one time. You have, to, you have to work hard. It's not going to naturally take place. You're going to have to, okay, uh, two days from now, I'm going to be driving to this place to pick up this at the store. So I want to make sure that I have this person in the car with me. One of the benefits of homeschooling, because you can just take them out and say, I'm going to go to the hardware store and I want to have just this person with me in the car so I can have one-on-one time with them. And then of course, all the other kids are going to say, can I go? Can I go? Can I go? One more blessing of having lots of kids, because unless you're a really bad father, they all want to be with you. Even if you're a bad father, they'll want to be with you because kids are naturally inclined towards their fathers and towards their mothers. So they're all going to say, I want to go, I want to go. No, I'm going to take just this person with me. We'll get an ice cream and I'm going to talk about their little heart and find out how their little heart is. Who do you get along with most in the family? Which sibling do you get along with most? Then they'll tell me. What class do you struggle with most? What do you dislike most about church? What do you enjoy most about church? What do you wish I would do more with you? What, what are the items that I, I do most with mama that you really, really like? Those are really important questions to ask. Probably best to ask those in those informal one-on-one times. So the formal time, make sure you have family worship. That's like church, if I can call it that. And then the informal time, ice cream, car, card games, That's going to be the informal time that you're pouring into your life. And that just goes back to Deuteronomy 6, teaching your children. And it says, teaching them in the way, right? When they rise up and when they lie down and when they have their pajamas on. And you're always teaching them, always spending time with them, trying to be as deliberate as possible. I think of Mark Dever's book, Deliberate Church. That is... What we do in the service is planned for, and we think about it, we pray about it. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of broken homes because it's not deliberate home. It's not deliberate family. You just kind of kind of go through life and hope it works together. You got to be de- deliberate about it. You have to write down a plan for it. How is your week going to look? How are you going to spend time with your kids? Which Bible verse is going to really ho- help this children child the most? Uh, what kind of 
education does he respond well to? Some of the kids don't respond well to a kind of rebuke or chastisement. So let's make sure that we have deliberate homes and not just deliberate church. That's very helpful, brother. I'm even uh, thinking of how I'm going to raise my son. Uh, Lord willing, he'll be here soon. And just seeing what you've done with your family and those things in family worship has been a good model for me as well. And seeing some of the fruit of that, we were speaking last week and I mentioned that Lawson has been very helpful in uh, ministry just when I've been out and about. And he has such a heart for the young boys that I'm trying to reach. And the question I want to find out is, how do you uh, uh, get your wife and your children on the same team in the sense that how do you have them be in love with ministry and committed to the vision? What are some things you can do around that? Because when I was with Lawson yesterday, uh, he was uh, planning a birthday party for one of the young boys with Shubuko. And he was like, yes, I'm so excited to buy the, the guy pants because he doesn't have pants. And uh, I really want to just bless him. And he's always looking for that heart. So you can see that he's on the team of wanting to serve the community and, uh, and reach people. What are some things you can do to uh, encourage that in a family as well? Well, before I answer that, just as a side note, I thought you were going to say, how do you get your children on the same team with each other <laughs> uh, as far as getting along? And I'd say, well, that's a challenge because, you know, they say about marriage, when you put two sinners together, you're going to have problems. And if you're not spirit filled, well, that's just two people. That's two adult people. But imagine putting eight immature, sinful mostly unconverted people together, there's going to be lots of, mm. you know, bickering. And so I'll just mention this now because it's, uh, it's on my mind, but then I'll come back and answer your question. And that is, uh, actually last night, I said uh, to some of my children, uh, this week, your assignment is you have to write a one-page letter to your other siblings that I told them who that who they were. You have to write a one-page letter to each one of them and tell them how much you love them and how much you're thankful for them. And on top of that, you have to have a five-minute time where you are praying just with that person one-on-one away from everyone else. And you're going to be doing this particular exercise as long as it takes, indef indefinitely, until I see more love and a camaraderie among mm, you. That's great. So we'll see how we'll see how it goes. Mm, but mm. that's just an effort to. Ha and it's not like there's a passage that says this, but you're just trying to use logic and you're trying to always bring scripture to bear. How do you get sinners to get along with each other? Well, you're you're teaching them principles. Do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you. Uh, don't look out for your own needs, but look for the needs of others. These are all godly character principles that you're trying to pass off to your children and then you try to give them practical ways to do that mm. so we'll see how that turns out mm. <laughs> but specifically to your question how do you get them on board in ministry i don't think it's really complicated the, the answer that comes to mind is your children will love what you love if you love sports more than anything else then they're going to see that and they're going to want to go to their sporting events on the weekend and miss church or miss prayer meeting. Uh, if they see that you love Kruger National Park, well, how will they see that you love Kruger National Park? Well, if you go to Kruger National Park and you make sure it's over a weekend and you don't meet with God's people on a Sunday, when you could, you could, you could make extra efforts to be with God's people. When you don't do that, they're going to see that. If they see that you love and are totally sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ, ministry, his kingdom, winning people to Christ, missions, that's going to filter into them. So I really don't think it's that complicated. I think that's uh, hopefully something that our children see in us. They see that we're dedicated. Uh, we're waking up early and going to bed late and they see that if something needs to be done, we're going to do it. And if they see their parents doing that, I think it's easy for the children to get 
on the same page. We don't push our kids necessarily toward missions. We say missions is wonderful. Missions is a wonderful calling. Uh, I tell them there's nothing I'd rather be than a missionary. I love being a missionary. If I had a thousand lives, I wish I could give them all as a missionary to Christ. But we don't say, we stop a little short of saying, but you also must be missionaries when you grow up, because that is definitely a special calling that you will fade fast if you're not called and you're doing it just because your parents did it or someone told you to do it. So we stop a little short of that, but we try to exalt how great it is. And not just missions, being in whatever calling the Lord has called you to. Now, if you're an accountant, if you're a banker, they, your, your children still need to see my parents will never miss church on Sunday. Like, and, and, and you can say that's all important, but if you find ways to miss because you're a little under the weather or you had a business trip or uh, there's a really important uh, sporting event, I mean, they're going to see that and they're going to be less inclined. But if, if, if you're like John Payton's father who said, I missed three services in 45 years and it was because it was a snowstorm and I tried to crawl on my hands and knees and I couldn't get there. Like, <laughs> then later on, you're gonna be like, John Payton, why were you so dedicated to church? Well, let me tell you this story about my father. Same idea. Um, love what scripture loves and your children will love what scripture loves, mostly. What a treat from Fundisi to our audience if you've enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to rate it and subscribe to keep posted with more upcoming content. Feel free to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting and submit any questions you may want answered in a future podcast. You can email those questions to paulslayline at gmail.com. You can also visit betweentwocultures.com for other resources like this. I'm your host, Yamikani Katunga, and until next time, that's it from Missionary Minds.